Okay, I've got two minutes after, so we'll just go ahead and get started here. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon to everybody joining today. Welcome to our April installment in our new webinar series that we uh, like to call Thirsty Thursdays. And before we get started, I'd like to just cover a few housekeeping items, if that's okay. Now, this session is being recorded. Uh, everyone that signed up, if you're, if you're on this meeting, uh, obviously you registered for it, you're going to get a copy of this recording uh, that we'll send out. It usually, uh, at, the, at the, the, the speed of technology, it might take uh, a little bit of time for that to, to all get recorded and for us to download it and get it sent to everybody, the, uh, the link, but we will definitely do that. Um, everyone will be muted for the session but we encourage you to ask questions. So you will see a Q&A icon. It should be on the bottom in the middle. Please use that to type in any questions or comments that you might have, and we will do our best to answer them. Uh, and we'll do that at the end of the presentation. We'll get to the presentation and then go to a Q&A session. Now, when you leave today's session, there will be a brief survey that will pop up. We would really appreciate it if you would complete that because it, it helps us to get the right information out to all of you. Uh, it might be for a future webinar topic or any uh, particular follow-up information that you might want. Um, and uh, the, the intent of this Thirsty Thursday series is to address the challenges, um, uh, quality, efficacy, uh, velocity in each stage of what we refer to as the infinity loop related to DevOps and how to combat those things. So um, the first two Thirsty Thursday sessions were meant to lay uh, a DevOps foundation, what it is, what are our biggest challenges. And now we're getting into the real meat of DevOps. So those of us who spent a career on the ops side like to say we're into the meat of DevOps now. So uh, starting with ops uh, today. So I need to, uh, to just do one quick notice here. Uh, there we go. So uh, our, our legal notice uh, so uh, for today, now we're not going to be uh, doing any futures. This is just for your information. This information is intended as confidential, not to be shared with third parties. So uh, uh, basically, that's that's it. Just want to uh, to mention that. I am your moderator. My name is Gary Hoagland of BMC, and uh, and our host for today is going to be uh, Mr. Will Brown. And, uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Will. And Will, if you'll just request um, control, I'll turn it over to you and you can have it from here. There we go. So thanks, Gary. So firstly, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing two of my esteemed colleagues who will be delivering the session uh, this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, depending on what your geography is. And the first is Nigel Slinger someone whose list of accomplishments would take the better part of the meeting to go over. <laughs> but suffice it to say, he's the brain trust and architect behind uh, Operations Insight that we'll be talking about uh, during this session. It's, uh, in my opinion, the next generation in, uh, in AI ops. And then next, our director of development for, uh, in the AI ops space, Adipta Sungupta, who also has a distinguished list of accomplishments in his own right. And lastly, as Gary mentioned, I'm Will Brown, a technical account manager for all things BMC mainframe solutions related. Next slide here. Since I have control, Gary, but it doesn't appear that it's, there we go. Well, all right. So just a quick glance at the agenda where I'll point out that we're going to spend the lion's share of the time talking about detecting and resolving issues faster with Amy Op Operations Insight, which represents here again, the next generation of AI ops. And also during the presentation, as Gary mentioned, please enter any questions you have into the QA or chat, and we'll have ample time to address along with additional product information at the end of the session. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Nigel. Uh, Nigel, are you there?
uh, yeah, so, uh, you want to do the next slide and I'll... Uh, yes, I'm... Uh, I will... Uh, there we I'll, go. I'll take over after this one then, right? So let's... I think there's a, just a little bit of latency there, Nigel, with the uh, passing of control. Yep. Okay. I, I think I have it now. Uh, and, and you can hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yep. Yep. So, um, so, so this is my kind of... Uh, Brief biography. I've actually been obviously in the industry for uh, for decades, but I, I used to actually have the lonely position of uh, being last in the line to get the bank off the floor or get the company out of the ditch. Um, and so I was always involved in uh, debugging very complex suspect problems, and it always took an awful lot of time. Uh, you know, later in my career, I actually uh, got into machine learning. So I actually uh, enabled the machine learning on Z, which you've probably seen from IBM. And uh, after leaving IBM, I um, went into design the next generation of monitor for BMC. So that this is kind of where we are right now. Let's see if I can advance this uh, slide here. Yeah, I think um, uh, now we've got it. So this is what I realized that people actually want from, you know, machine learning and AI, right? Um, they want to really lower the mean time to detection. So basically I've got a problem, but I don't want to find that problem at 10 o'clock on a Monday. I want to actually find it when I made the change. And interestingly enough, for all the Z customers I've ever known, they don't tend to roll big changes at 10 a.m. on a Monday. What they tend to do is, is roll it at 2 a.m. on a Sunday morning or some maintenance window that is kind of very benign. They might do a soft launch. But what they want to do is find problems well in advance of, of where the, uh, the main production workloads are going to be. So if I can actually detect the problem an awful lot sooner, then it also gives me longer to do something. So for example, some of the customers that we've worked with, you know, we've come across problems where they've rolled a change on the weekend and they've actually hit the floor at, uh, at 10 o'clock on, on a Monday when the main workload comes in. And what we found is that if we'd have detected it when the change rolled in, even if it was a very low transaction rate, then we could have actually given two days of pondering on what to do with this problem. You know, do I back out the change? You know, do I rebalance my workload? You know, do I change a few other things, right? Do I increase the CPU allocation? All the things that I can do to actually get out of it. I, I can actually do it much, much earlier. And obviously the sooner you actually put in that re resolution, then the less costly it's gonna be in the end. The last thing you need to have is, it's kind of 10 o'clock on a Monday and everything is going down and you've only got minutes to react before the whole system goes. So, Knowing up front what's going on is really part of the problem. And that obviously will, will pay dividends, but when it comes to the, the actual resolution and the system availability. So the other thing that um, we found is that really people just want to make it easy. You'll find a, a lot of AI solutions they actually look like 
lots of graphs and statistics and stuff and it, it still requires a lot of effort you know maybe from data scientists or uh, statisticians or people that have to crunch the data so you have a, a lot of this graph type output that really doesn't mean a lot in the end it, you're kind of visualizing something and then kind of hoping and what people really want is is something that you know they just bring their data so all of the expertise and the data science and everything is, is just built in you don't actually have to do anything you know having said that um people that run on the z platform they really need something to be low cost so if i were to box this up and, and put it on the z platform i need to have it as cheap as possible and I, I believe we're going to have a, a follow-on session on how we minimize all of this cost. But essentially, it has to be cheap enough that I can actually run it on the platform. And that allows me to take advantage of data gravity and, uh, and a few other things so that I can actually be right there where the action is. I would say that the biggest requested item we have is the easy button, which is don't actually tell me anything about machine learning or artificial intelligence or what you're doing just give me the answer and again you know in, in the heat of battle you just want to know what do i do what what is the problem so that i can find a way out of it so how we actually got there in some respects you don't mind you're going to use that for later justification to the management team or the executives of why exactly i think that this is the problem but for now let's just assume this is the problem and so this easy button technique is, is something we'll, we'll go through in some of the uh the next slides so the the, the next point I think is, is an interesting one that a lot of people, they come out with answers using machine learning or a, an AI techniques. And you should be able to set them in front of the, uh, the spotlight and ask them to explain what they're doing. And they should be able to explain it in a language that you actually understand. And if they can't do that, then there's probably something wrong with it. So everything has to be completely explainable. And the most powerful ML techniques are completely explainable why they work and why they should work and why they'll work in the future. But you will find that there's some people that will try and bombard you with mathematical algorithms. You know, our, our systems use random forest or we're using kernel density estimation or we're, we're doing this the, the algorithm itself really doesn't matter what you have to explain is why that algorithm and why that data work together to give me the right answer and the last thing on this slide is basically there's always something wrong somewhere in the system And this is really where traditional monitoring tends to fall down, that if I set lots of alerts and alarms, there's a good chance it's going to be wrong anyway. So if I have 50 things that I'm monitoring on my system, one of them may show that I have a problem. And so what I have to do is actually make it wide enough that it must be a problem. So it's a bit like setting a speed limit on a freeway of 150 miles an hour and say, well, if a car's going 150, it must be wrong. But actually, if a car's going 67, it also might be wrong. But you tend to set things fairly loose because there's always somebody that's slightly out. And that's one thing that you have to deal with. Uh, and, and this is where the multivariate techniques come in. 
So again, this, this false positive suppression is probably one of the key parts. Otherwise, this thing is just going to keep you awake at night. I think I got to advance this slide. <laughs> there does seem to be a lag. I think you're right. Uh, okay, so this is what what I call the easy button. Where, in this case, what, what I actually did was I injected some poison into one of our test systems. So I basically gave it a bad DB2 access path. So this thing isn't running at high transaction rate, but I, I do have a bad access path. This is kind of um, you know, the equivalent of putting in you know, some new application at two in the morning. And what's happened is we've done all of our KPIs, we've done all of our machine learning, uh, we've done all of our false positive suppression. We've come to a conclusion, then we've gone into a decision tree mode of actually doing what a human would do, but just doing it at machine speed to look around the, the rest of the traditional monitoring. And we've come up with the answer that this SQL statement is actually the one that's causing the problem. So at this point, you really don't care whether we're using random forest or you know, we're using any other the machine learning techniques. You want to be able to go in and say, this is the guy that's doing the damage to my system. And so you can actually see from here that there, there is no, you know, machine learning stuff so much. Um, but on the far left, you'll, you'll see here the buffer pool read, we have a Z score of 51,000. So Z score is um, a deviation from the, the normal range. So somebody was doing a lot more buffle reads because I have a bad access path and here's the guy. So this is kind of what people want. Having said that, let's, let's go explain a few things. So this is standard monitoring here where I'm actually just going to set a threshold. And I think, you know, everybody does that. You know, if my transaction takes more than five seconds, then maybe set an alarm. Um, the problem is that my transaction might be a 30 millisecond transaction. And I have to set it to five seconds to, to stop it squawking. So all through the day here, It'll run, and then finally, when it gets really bad, my alarm will go off. And you notice my alarm is, is an upper limit here. So the fact that some of this really is not normal, I don't really know. But finally, my limit alarm fires, and now I... I've got to move fast because this thing is way out of line. So these could be my 30 millisecond transactions. And now they're at five seconds by the time my alarm goes off. So that means that my time to resolve is actually pretty short because the world is ending. I'm already in deep trouble. So by the, by the time the alarm is actually squawking, I'm in deep trouble already. I've just got to move very fast. So if we take this and compare that to uh, an AI approach, what we're doing here is actually using a time series. 
which means that every minute of the day is different to me. So if this is two in the morning and this is the transaction rate is over or under where it should be at two in the morning, then I can get that deviation and flag that as an anomaly. And you notice what I'm doing there is having a bi-directional approach. So here I've, I've just got one direction. I'm, I'm just going to set an upper limit. Whereas using the AI techniques, I can actually have a bi-directional approach. So I can say, well, there's actually not enough transactions for two in the morning. So something is wrong in the network or you know, the transactions are not coming through. Or I can say there's too many. And again, that could be a, you know, a different kind of problem, but it's, but it's bi-directional. And you notice that when I actually detect this, and I might detect it here at two in the morning, I've now got essentially the rest of the day to work out what the answer is. And it may mean that I actually resolve the problem you know, somewhere back here. And I don't have to live with the pain for the, the whole rest of the journey. So, you know, it's, it's a very subtle difference between here's my static thresholds and here's my AI thresholds. So if we actually put that in real numbers, with the KPIs and the time series that are built into our models, what I'm actually doing is setting the equivalent of about 5 million alerts. Uh, and, and certainly, it, you know, I, as I've gone forward and developed the product more, we're probably heading towards 10 million equivalent. And there is no human that can actually have 10 million alerts and understand what they are. So you imagine every minute of the day is, is a different minute to us. So I know the difference between your 5 p.m. on a Friday and your 5 p.m. on a Thursday. And because of that, I can work out how this KPI is actually working. And, and this is key using uh, time series rather than anything else, right? So what you have to do then is we're going to score the KPIs uh, in, in real time. And in our case, we actually normalize the data to a minute. Um, we do that for both DB2 and the RMF uh, statistics. And then once we have that, we can actually build up a picture of what was actually going on. So the other thing that, again, people are, uh, I, oh, maybe they're, they're not so aware of when, when you're setting univariate alerts, but I know that things link together. The way that the Z platform works and the Sysplex is basically, I push a balloon somewhere, it's going to pop somewhere else. So I know from years of experience that basically, if a system slows down, then the way that it's going to react is to try and add more threads to try and get the workload done. So when I add more threads, I'm going to use more storage. When I add more threads, I'm going to make the application scale wider than it normally does. I'm going to introduce more contention. When I introduce more contention, I'm going to have more CPU. And so there's a lot of cause and effect relationships that essentially are going to be created by all these multivariates. So instead of watching a single KPI, you're actually watching hundreds at once. And each of these KPIs are going to have to be grouped together. So all the CPU KPIs, all the storage 
and we can put them in groups and then actually put those groups together. And so all of this really is just driven by domain expertise. So obviously the, there's the stuff that I've done over the years. And we've also got a lot of other domain experts that also, that also have decades of experience. And we can put together basically all of the knowledge that we have, build it into these groups with the data scientists, and then have a way of identifying the events. So it's kind of almost like having you know, the world's best debuggers in your pocket, but actually having it as a tool. So the other thing that, that we're doing, again, as a practical approach is assuming that we're just gonna put the thermometer in one place. So we have this many to one data source. So in our case, we, we, we have the GOS statistics, all the, the standard RMF, CMF type, and we also have the DB2 SMF 100. So the DB2 SMF 100 is immensely powerful because it, if you're not actually moving data around, then you're not doing anything. So I can tell there's a kicks problem just by the fact that there's no DB2 access. So exploiting that many to one relationship is kind of how uh, we're, you know, we're gonna go forward with this thing. So it's a lot easier to monitor something in one place than it is to monitor 600 kicks regions. It's just an economy of scale and it makes it cheaper and much more powerful. And, and this is not a, a technique that hasn't been used in other places. Uh, this many to one data source was used extensively in uh, COVID-19. So instead of monitoring the population of 10 million, they just go down to the sewage plant and take a sample. And then they know that COVID is actually in that population. So this many to one data source is used in, in a different forms all over the world. But that's something that we exploit. So what we're trying to do as well is, is get all of the domain expertise and data science embedded into the product so that you don't have to bring your own data scientists. So, and once you have that, you know, we'll try and get onto the easy button so that you can actually have something to action. You know, I, I need to get rid of this plan. I need to get rid of this task or whatever to actually fix my problem. So this is the basic um, approaches you can use once you've got the data. Uh, I'll start with the one in the middle. Right? The, the one in the middle is the patient zero approach, which is kind of standard what people use. This says that the first bad message that I have must be the problem. And you'll notice that people often are going back through logs, they're going back through a, a bend messages and everything else and say, well, the, this was the first one that I got, so this must be the problem. And that may work for about, uh, you know, 50% of the time. The only problem with that is often you find that everything goes at the same time. So I have 15 things that all went at the same time. I, I got a load of timeouts. I got a load of events. I got all of these bad messages and they all came out in the same minute. So at that point, the patient zero approach really doesn't uh, buy you an awful lot. So what you can do is go into the event classification and we'll, we'll talk more about that in, um, in a couple more slides. But uh, 
if I can take all of my groups and all of my scores and all of the kind of um, areas together, and I can generate into a graph database structure. So graph databases are fairly new to uh, the world, I would say. They're, they're not like relational databases. So it's not like DB2. Graph databases are all cause and effect. So I, I can actually say that this thing caused this other thing. And I can dynamically build a picture of saying it, if A cause B and B cause C, then actually I can infer mathematically that A cause C, right? So, and, and that, that's what this is actually doing here. It's saying, well, all of this stuff is actually in a normally state, but this is actually where the, the path starts. What I can do as well is um, if I have this groups here that are in anomaly state, I've got my thousands of metrics. I can actually just give you the metrics that matter. So using time series database, which is another kind of database that's fairly new to, uh, to the world, I can actually put in the metrics and just give you the actual metrics that in the anomaly state in context. So out of all these hundreds and hundreds of metrics, these are the ones you should be looking at. And so it's just another technique that allows us to do that. So we get into false positive suppression. This is the, the big thing here is, you know, we need feature engineering, right? So feature engineering basically says that I am gonna pick the KPI that actually works and I'm gonna do that for you. So we spend a lot of time with data scientists going through which metrics actually work to give you the longest uh, relationship as, as far as cause and effect. So all of this feature engineering is kind of the key of machine learning. So when someone tells you that I can take all of my data and put it into Splunk or put it somewhere else. What they don't tell you is I can put those thousand metrics into Splunk, but somebody has to tell me which ones, which derivatives, what transformers I apply to those things that I put in Splunk to allow me to get an answer. Otherwise I'll, <clears throat> I'll just get lots of visualizations. So this feature engineering is really the lines of code that go into any machine learning product. The other thing I have to do is couple these things together, right? So I, I have to do multivariate. So I have to take the features that I've got, the KPIs, and I actually have to group them together to make them a multivariate. That way I can actually have one or two things that are not quite right. And the fact I'm using a multivariate technique allows me to not have this false positive. So the, the graph databases is another way that we can come in and say, well, if I have more threads, then that's an anomaly state, but is that causing somewhat something else? So are those threads causing more storage to be used? So more real frames, is it causing my machine to page? And so using graph structures, I can actually go in, put all these things together and work out whether having these extra three 
threads is actually causing me any problems at all, right? And what I can do is, is something we'll talk about is path inversion where I can actually work out that something isn't there and then look for something that is. So one of the other things that we realized early on is the restart detection was something that was needed. So every time you restart a system, then some of the storage is not warmed up. You know, some of the thread counts are not warmed up. So you actually got a rash of false positives. And so what we're trying to do there is say, well, if we detect the system is restarted, we will actually automatically turn on these KPIs following a warm-up period. So we'll automatically watch them for you. And when they come back in range, then we'll enable them so that they're part of the, uh, the whole scoring process. So the other thing we can do is say, well, if it's a special business day, we can reduce the sensitivity knowing that the workload is going to fluctuate. And we can have that automatically done with calendaring. So this is kind of a, a standard approach. Um, false positives are also caused a lot by drifting models. So we, we actually have a, a way of assessing model health. So if your model starts to degrade, you know when you're going to uh, actually have to retrain it. So all of these things go into the, the false positive suppression. So this is part of our uh, graph structure. And what we've got here is, in this case, I've got my DML, which is really SQL. So my SQL is down. In fact, everything is down. But this CPU is up. So currently it looks like I have a CPU problem. And you can see here, I've, I've got this RLM CPU times, the score is plus six. So, so it's essentially you can think of that the six times off where it really should be. But everything else, when I follow the path, it's all negative. So I've got less things coming in, I'm doing less things, I'm not accessing data very much, but I'm burning a lot of CPU. So what we're doing here is saying, well, if I try and find out stuff that this SQL that's not happening, that's really difficult. In order to find out what's not happening, I would have to take this SQL from today. And then I would have to compare it with yesterday or last week. So really, I'm going to have to do interval generation. But what we can do is say, well, yeah, this is down, but something else in the path is up. So in which case, why don't I just go for the thing that's positive? And so we will automatically find that there's something not happening, but then if we can reverse the path, we'll find something that is positive. Now you can go and find out what's causing this. It's a lot easier to find out something that's causing a positive than it is to find out something that's causing a negative. And this is basically the, the, the technique that we have. I think I may have bounced one slide there, did I? Yep. So the, so this is kind of how you see the, the graph structures work. So you imagine if you had all your metrics and said that I know that if this transaction slows down, then I'm going to need more transactions in the system to try and get the same throughput. 
and I can follow all of these cause and effect relationships. So this is really, you know, the most powerful, uh, you know, piece of the processing. And I actually believe that in the future, most monitors will be built this way. Instead of you have a storage alarm go off, there'll be some other metric that's been encoded in a graph database that says, I have more thread counts and I'm using more storage. And I'm using more CSA because of it. So you should be able to explain why I'm using more of stuff through these graph databases. So finally, we'll get back to the, um, the easy button. So we've talked about how we score the data. We have all the feature engineering. Uh, we have the time series database. We have the in-context in graphing. Uh, you know, we've used all of the other techniques, the path inversion. But actually, this is really what people want. In this case, we found there's a contention problem. We drove our decision tree processing. And we found that there's 102 waiters on this resource. The longest wait is only seven seconds. Now you imagine in DB2, most people don't time out until a minute. So we've detected an anomaly that currently is only causing a seven second lag. And the reason for it is somebody's got a batch that job that's actually run into the online day. And this is the object that we're having the contention on. So at this point, you've got to decide whether you want to cancel this batch job. You want to increase its WLM priority, try and get it out of the way. And now you have a, a way out. But at this point, the longest wait is only seven seconds. You know, as this batch job grinds on, this wait time eventually will cause people to start timing out. So we're going to detect this long before people actually start to suffer the pain of timeouts and slowdowns and everything else. So, and then hopefully people get an idea of what it is. I started with the easy button and I ended with the easy button because I think that's, that's what people are really looking for. Um, but as I said before, all, all the explanation and the explainability of all the ML techniques should be there as well. So you should be able to explain everything you're doing and how it works. And I think at, at that point, we'll uh, hand it back to Will and see what uh, questions we have. So before we segue into the QA portion, I'd like to say great job, Nigel, as always, uh, acknowledge your insight and your passion here are off the charts. And I personally learned more about the product and the discipline in general each time I attend these sessions. So, so great job there. We're gonna uh, open it up for, uh, for questions now. And I see just a couple of questions, Nigel, that have come in. So one of the first is, can you please describe the functional differences between ME Ops monitoring and OI, or more generally speaking, mainframe operations monitoring versus your traditional event management tools? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. The, um, the, the main difference is that, uh, I would say tr traditional monitoring, you tend to have to go and set all of the events and the alarms and the alerts yourself. And what you're doing is dealing with what is good for your system. So that can be quite a tedious process. And it, it, in the end, you often find that people set the same 34 alerts across hundreds of systems. 
So they think they have thousands of alerts, but actually they have the same 34 they just put in all, all of the same places. Um, <clears throat> the main difference between that and an AI technique is that you just bring your data and we'll learn what your normal is. And then we're going to set the equivalent of more than 5 million alarms for you. So based on that, it's going to be uh, a, a lot easier for you to find out what normal is. Uh, it'll allow you to detect stuff in the middle of the night that normally you can't because you, you don't send tend to set um, alerts and alarms for different hours of the day. So it, it you know, this is a, a I would say a, a more kind of self-programming world where the data itself that you have in your systems is going to be the one that programs the alerts for you. So this is my normal. Just go watch it for me. Okay. And the next one, uh, can the embedded AI and ML-based algorithms that drive the logic functions be augmented at customer discretion? So for example, if a customer has an expert level data scientist, or are they completely locked and proprietary? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say that. Uh, locked in proprietary is, is, is probably the wrong word, but it's uh, you know, if we've done all the heavy lifting, so we've worked out which KPIs go together, uh, which groups go together, we've embedded them in the graph database. It would be very difficult for people to actually come up to that level and do all of that research for us, right? So we, we've probably got years of research in doing that. So adding in random KPIs. And people tend to think of the KPI level, whereas we think of the group level and uh, you know, the classification level. So it's, uh, we've, we've not exactly locked people out. What we've done is we've done all the heavy lifting for them. So if there's something that doesn't work after all of our research, then it's really down to us to fix it. You know, People don't need to worry about uh, putting in, in their own stuff. You know, we'll actually go and, and make it work. And we've actually had uh, hundreds and hundreds of production days of systems that customers have sent into us for analysis. And each time we find something that, you know, maybe we can't quite detect that we should detect, we're just constantly improving our algorithms. And so we want the general algorithms that kind of work for everyone. So we haven't locked people out. Uh, what we said is it's, it's just very difficult for people to uh, follow that kind of research because it, it is a lot of data science that's gone on. And quite often system programming departments just don't have that amount of data science resource available to them. Right. The next one says, how do you continually retrain the model or the algorithm to analyze metrics that were previously business normative, but have changed, let's say, as a result of bringing up a new application to support a business process of sort of outward facing service? Yeah, that, that's another really good question. That's, um, so the, the standard technique for assessing a model is you actually say, well, I'm going to take a, a situation, you know, once, maybe once a week on a Friday, 10 a.m. And it's normal. I, I know the system's normal at that point. And then what you do is you start to watch the amount of scores that are coming on that are saying this thing is bad. So the amount of metrics that are slight, slightly drifting. And so what, what we've had to do is build in a model evaluation so that you can define your own window whenever that is. And essentially what you do is you rescore the data and say, well, that day was normal, but you're telling me that there were things wrong and really they weren't. It's just that over the past six months, my workload has increased. So you're now telling me that my transaction rate is higher than it should be. Whereas in fact, all that's happened is the workload has grown over time. And so what we'll do is schedule these evaluations. And then at that point, we'll come back and say, well, Yes, your, uh, your model now is, is only in the fair state. It's not in the good state. So it's probably worth retraining. And as I said in the, in the previous question, if we have 
all these features that are driven by data, then when you change the model, you're really changing the programming of the entire solution. So it means that you know maybe every month or so you're reprogramming and saying that this is what my normal is, but that's actually learned from the data. But we do provide the evaluation technique. So I think that's uh, that answers uh, that one. Sure. And one more here. Uh, does OI augment or complement Amy Ops, or can you describe how it sources those operational data stores in general? Yeah, that's that's another good question. The uh, we actually use SMF directly, so the so Amy OI doesn't require any of the uh, other BMC monitors uh, in it in its purest form. So all of the the, the graph structures the time series database are all built in. Um, but what we do have now is a common UI with uh, the rest of the Amy Ops components. So I, I can drop into the traditional monitoring strings uh, and all those views using either hyperlinks or I can actually just add in the views. Uh, and and that, that new UI has been out for, uh, I think, uh, since the start of April and, uh, and the initial version was, I think last April. So they're, they're kind of converging together. This is kind of like an umbrella on the top of all the other monitors. And you can actually link back and forth, uh, you know, between the two. So that, you know, should make it easier for people. Uh, the actual decision tree logic that we use when we're gonna drill down and find out exactly who is doing the damage we're getting the data directly from uh, the kind of main view data collectors. And what we're doing there is really doing what you would do on a keyboard, but we're just doing it at machine speed. So, you know, anybody that can analyze a thousand threads in 10 milliseconds, you know, would be able to understand that it, you just can't put that amount of data in your head. Whereas we can suck in all the data from the current system analyze it, summarize it, and then give the answer. Normally a person would take a, a snapshot and then they would go away for an hour and work out the answer. So we can do that in milliseconds. That's great. And just one more here. Um, can the analysis be expanded to include unconnected data sets or disparate unnormalized ones? Yeah. Yeah, right now that that is the direction to actually uh, get unconnected products that normally are very siloed and we will start to put them together. So now we have uh, DB2 events, we have ZOS events and using the graph structures, we can put those together. So that, that, that world is now beginning to unlock. Um, it's, uh, I think that the siloed approach of having individual stuff is, is obviously going to go away because you know that everything is interconnected. Um, that they're not connected as far as data, but once you get the data, you can merge them together. So more of an open, open borders uh, approach, if you will. It, yeah, open borders and, um, and also across the enterprise. Oh, okay. you, you know, everything is connected to everybody. You know, it's a, a, a butterfly clap, you know, flaps its wings in the Amazon and a, a DB2 system goes down somewhere. I mean, that's kind of... <laughs> All right. Well, that was the last question I see, unless somebody uh, has any more. Thanks, Nigel. Uh, here again, uh, great job, good information. So just a reminder that we'll send out the links to the recording and presentation from today that uh, we mentioned at the onset, and it, it will also be inclusive of the responses to other questions. So please look for that follow-up email from either Gary or myself. And I wanna make you aware that there are a number of ways to engage us if you'd like more information, such as our BMC communities, product documentations and collateral repository, which is docs.bmc.com and also YouTube. And note, these are all accessible in the public sphere. So all these are actionable links you're seeing on the slides here. And here again, 
we'll be sending out the slide deck as well. And so for everyone who carved out some time to join us today, a resounding thanks on behalf of BMC. I hope that the session was informative and met with your expectations. And I'd also like to point out that these webinars are being held regularly on a variety of topics, as Gary mentioned uh, at the onset. So please look for our next Thirsty Thursday series where we'll talk about uh, some of the topics that you're seeing in front of you here. Uh, the first is an introduction to the different workshops that can help you on your DevOps journey. And then another uh, about increasing your knowledge around DevOps with, uh, with these high value solutions that we're talking about here. So we certainly uh, invite you to attend these sessions. And BMC is also very customer centric, which means we encourage you to uh, submit ideas. Uh, our um, a lot of our product design is uh, uh, is driven by our customers, and those get fed directly to our development cycle, and then we score them based on level of interest, the number of ones that um, that come in, and here again they get factored uh, into the development. And then we're also more than happy to procedurally walk you through how to go about navigating this if you have any more information around it, or if you need more information around it more specifically. And then lastly, please don't forget to complete the survey. As Gary mentioned uh, at, the, at the very beginning of the session, we appreciate the feedback that helps to drive uh, content for our future sessions. Gary, uh, any closing comments here? No, I think that covers everything. And uh, we sure appreciate everybody attending. This, uh, this was great. Nigel, another great presentation. Looking forward to the next one as, uh, as we uh, kind of take our next step with, uh, with Amy Ops Insight in our next session. All right. Well, thanks, everyone.